The Guristus Pirates ships have long been some of my favourite vessels to fly in the EVE universe, and the Rattlesnake, despite being a slow and cumbersome beast, is no different, despite the fact that I usually prefer smaller, faster moving ships. In fact, when I used to play EVE Echoes a lot, the Rattlesnake was pretty much my PvE ratting ship of choice, and it's no different here in EVE Online. This is an excellent beast for ratting in C3 anomalies. It's slightly more expensive than some of its contemporaries, but the fact that it can clear every Every single site with ease and without much difficulty at all makes it an excellent choice for players who are looking to take C3 ratting seriously. In this video I'm going to show you how I fit my rattlesnake, we're going to talk about how this ship works and what makes it so powerful, it is both a missile and drone boat, and we're also going to talk about a little thing known as the gecko. I love this ship to pieces and hopefully by the end of the video you will too. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. In this video we're going to be taking a look at this monster on screen, the Guristus Pirates Rattleship Battlesnake. The Guristus Pirates Rattlesnake Battleship. Now, I love the lore of the Guristus Pirates. In short, the two leaders of the Guristus Pirates, Fatal and the Rabbit, used to be Kaldari Navy pilots, but they both deserted and set up the Guristus Pirates after basically being overlooked for the promotion and getting sick and tired of the conditions that they were under. During that time, Koroko Kosakami, also known as the Rabbit, stole the designs for both the Merlin and the Moa, and then repurposed them for their own use in the Guristus Pirates, retrofitting their weapon slots and that to make them missile and drone ships and far more powerful than their Kaldari Navy equivalents. The Rattlesnake, on the other hand, has a bit more of an interesting history to it. It's not entirely clear whether they stole the blueprints for the Scorpion and then repurposed it into the Rattlesnake, but there are rumours that actually the Rabbit designed the Rattlesnake first, and then it was the Kaldari Navy that repurposed that for the Scorpion. There's this really interesting dynamic between the Guristus Pirates and the Ishikone Corporation, because Otro Gurushi, the CEO of the Ishikone Corporation, was actually raised by the Guristus, and there are some really quite subversive links there that make for a really interesting story that I'll probably cover in a lore video at some point in the future. Anyway, for the purposes of today's video, I'm going to be showcasing this amazing ship in C3 wormhole ratting. It is a little bit more expensive than some of its contemporaries, thus it is going to take you a touch longer to make it ISK positive, but considering it can run every single one of the sites without question, and it does so really easily and efficiently, makes it an excellent option for people who enjoy this kind of ship to take it out into a C3 and just start earning bank. If you do find this video useful or helpful, please hit like, drop a comment down below, it really helps the channel out. But if you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel and keep me making content like this, you can do so by heading to my Patreon page, my Redbubble merchandise store, or even just dropping a tip in my PayPal tip jar. That's all linked in the description down below. And if you're fairly new to EVE Online, I do have a referral link in the description as well. If you haven't used a referral link yet, click that link, log into your account, and you'll get 1 million free skill points, even on long existing accounts. We've also got the Catskull Discord where you can come and talk with like-minded pilots like yourself and even join the Catskull Corporation if that sounds like something you might be interested in. We're heavily involved in wormholes but we do have a high sec base of operations as well to help train up new pilots. Anyway, all of that said and done then, let's jump right into talking about the Guristus Pirates Rattlesnake Battleship. Whew, got it right that time. As usual, we're going to start by taking a look at the ship itself, because it's got a bit of unusual stats because it is a uh, faction battleship, a pirate faction battleship. Now, because pirate faction ships benefit from two of the racial skills, it does mean this is fairly skill point intensive, and certainly the Rattlesnake is an incredibly skill point intensive ship, because not only are you having to train Galente battleship and Kaldari battleship, whereas say something like the Dominix or the Raven only requires one or the other, you've also got two weapons weapon systems to consider here. You're going to be using both drones and missiles, and so you are going to need to have trained fairly deep into both of those. But anyway, we're going to take a look at the traits first of all, then we're going to have a look at some of the attributes later to understand how this ship ticks. So first of all, roll bonuses. We have a 275% bonus to sentry drone and heavy drone damage and hit points. Now, essentially, the Rattlesnake can actually only launch two drones. It's only got a 50 megabit per second bandwidth compared to some of the other battleships, like, for example, the, uh, the Dominix, which can launch a full flight of heavy drones. This is only going to be able to launch two, but it does so with an incredible bonus to them that essentially means you're flying as if it were a full flight. In fact, slightly more than a full flight of drones. 
We also get a 100% bonus to shield extender hit points. So if you're using shield extenders, they are going to be a much better fit than anything else. We get a 50% bonus to armor plate hit points, but I really don't recommend armor tanking a rattlesnake, though it can be used in some bait fits or troll fits, and a 5% additional bonus to reinforced bulkhead hit points. Again, I really don't see hull tanking a rattlesnake as a solid idea, but there we go. It is there if you decide you want to use that bonus. Yes. Then we have the Galente Battleship and Kaldari Battleship's bonuses. Now, Galente Battleship gives you a 10% bonus to kinetic and thermal missile damage. It should be noted that is only to kinetic and thermal, therefore you want to be using Scourge and Inferno only on this ship. It is pointless trying to use Mjolnir, it is pointless trying to use Nova, because you just don't get that bonus. And a 50% at full training bonus is not to be sniffed at. It's a nice whack of damage for those missile types. Again, you can theoretically fly this and do this content with Galente Battleship 4 and Kaldari Battleship 4, but this is the kind of ship that really benefits you going all in on it, and I do strongly recommend getting that all the way up to 5 if you can. Same with Kaldari Battleship. 4% bonus to all shield resistances is pretty nice. That's 16% if you stop at level 4, but if you take it all the way to level 5, that is a 20% bonus to all shield resistances. And for the purposes of open and honesty, essentially I am running at Kaldari and Galente Battleship 5 for this video, because I honestly do believe if you're going to be flying something like a rattlesnake, you should be making the most of it. You can run this at 4, but I recommend getting it to 5. Now if we look under the attributes again, you'll see here that we do have a drone bandwidth of 50 megabits per second. Remember that heavy drones take up 25 megabits per second each, therefore you can get two heavy drones out of here. And it should be noted that when we have a look at the stuff here, the roll bonuses, it is sentry drone and heavy drone damage and hit points only. You do not get bonuses to medium or light drones, therefore you should be using heavies to the fullest of your ability. So you're going to have two heavy drones out and about for the most part. We do get a decent sized drone bay as well, 175 uh, cubic meters means we do get some options in there. You can theoretically carry, well, you do the math on that and work out how many you can carry there. Um, but we are going to be using a little drone known as the Gecko for the most part here, with some other drones as support if you need them, but we'll talk about those later on. Otherwise, this is a pretty solid ship. It is definitely a shield tank when we look at its stats as we come down here. You'll see that the shields are significantly higher uh, capacity and with more resistances across the board than the armor or the structure. Not to say it's got low armor or structure. They're just literally half the size of the shield. You can kind of see over on the side here. We're looking at nearly 25,000 hit points on the shield, whereas it's only 12 to 13,000 on the armor and structure. Again, this is why I say when we look at the traits, there the armor plates and the reinforced bulkhead hit points. I don't really see much use in those, but there we are. Anyway, that's the ship. Let's take a look at the fit. Now what makes this so beastly is that we have a pretty high shield tank that is completely passive, but whilst it's passive, we're also completely cap stable, 100% capacitor stability and a 7.5 gigajoule per second excess capacitor recharge rate. That means essentially we can sit there and take one of the newts, no trouble. Any of the six gigajoules per second newts are not going to be an issue to us. The 12s are going to be, but only if we leave them around long enough to fully cap us out. Obviously in a combat situation, getting full capped out is going to stop you warping away if someone does drop in on you. If you are sitting at zero capacitor, you're not running away if someone drops in on you. So do bear that in mind. You do still want to take the newts out as quickly as possible, but we're going to be looking at a very different target priority to usual here because we don't necessarily need to prioritize all of the newts we can just go for the ones that are going to be newting us out a little bit too heavily and fortunately that's also the ships that are going to be doing pretty heavy damage to us for our weapons here because we've got bonuses to kinetic and thermal missiles it's not specified what type of missiles, we can kind of use anything. But considering these sites are going to have frigates, they're going to have cruisers, and they're going to have battleships, it's worth going for something that can apply reasonably well to all of those. Therefore, for the high slots, I've gone for Rapid Heavy Missile Launcher 2s with Kaldari Navy Scourge Heavy Missiles. I just stick with the Kaldari Navy Scourge. I don't bother going for Rage or Fury or anything like that here. We just... Not, not Rage and Fury, those are heavy assault missiles. You know what I mean. I don't bother going for the Tech 2 ammunition here. I think the Kaldari 
Ferrari Navy Scourge are a little bit cheaper and do the job just fine. They have an excellent uh, like balance of damage, application, and range. And this way you just don't have to worry about changing your ammo at all. Now you can also carry some Kaldari Navy uh, Inferno heavy missiles there as well, just in case you want to take advantage of anything that jumps in on you running uh, with different uh, resistances. But remember, the sleepers that we're going up against are omni-resist. Their resistances are equal across the board, so it really doesn't matter if you're going for Scourge or if you're going for Inferno. And just for ease of use, I tend to only pack the one. You'll see when it comes to sort of a PvP situation, we'll figure that out later. There's more stuff going on there. Um, just go with the Kaldari Navy Scourge Heavy Missiles in Rapid Heavy Missile Launcher 2s. These have excellent DPS. The only downside is they have a 35 second reload time, which does really get to me. Anyone who's watched me live streaming in the Catskull Discord will know that I sit there and I'm just like, oh for goodness sake, I hate this reload time so much, but I do understand why it's there, because otherwise Rapids would just be insanely good. The other high slot we've got is a Drone Link Augmenter. This is just to make those drones apply their damage a little bit better, move a little faster, get a little further, that kind of thing. And this twins nicely in the low slots with two Drone Damage Amplifier 2s in order to just make sure those drones are doing as much damage as possible. And you'll see we've got a total DPS of 1085.6, of which 611.2 DPS is just the drones. Now historically I made the mistake of thinking that this was just the turrets and this was just the drones, therefore you added those two together. You don't. This is the combined DPS up here. This is how much is exclusive to the drones. So of this ship, 611 is purely from the drones, whereas about another 500 comes from the missiles. So that's worth bearing in mind. <clears throat> For the missile DPS as well, we've got an omni sorry, not missile DPS, drone DPS, we've got an omnidirectional tracking enhancer down here in order just to help those drones do their thing a little bit better. I've been watching a lot of Legend of Korra recently, and so saying do the thing suddenly just makes me think of Varric. Anyway, then we have what we need for tanking. For the mid slots, this is a whole bunch of shield recharger twos. Alongside in the bottom here, we've got shield power relay twos. We then have a Republic Fleet Large Shield Extender, a Pythium B-Type Electromagnetic Shield Amplifier, and a Pythium C-Type Thermal Shield Amplifier. Essentially, this gives us a massive shield tank of 24,406 hit points, with resistances across the board of 52% and upwards. We get a really heavy shield recharge rate of 211 hit points per second, but it should be noted <clears throat> That is not enough to fully out-tank any one wave. There are some waves here that do like 400 DPS, and thus they will start chewing through your shields. In those waves, your aim is to kill the heavy-hitting targets as quickly as possible in order to reduce the incoming DPS below your shield recharge rate. And believe me, the Rattlesnake has more than enough firepower to make that a reality. For the rigs then, finally, I'm running straight up large core defense field purger 1s. You can upgrade these to core defense field purger 2s if you've got a little bit of extra isk to splash on those, and it can be worth it. Ultimately, the field purger 1s are good enough, but the field purger 2s just give you that little bit of extra whack um, to, in order to just keep those shields going up as best as possible. It's still not going to be enough to out-tank uh, out the DPS on some of those heavier waves, but again, your DPS is going to reduce the size of those waves and thus the incoming damage damage fairly quickly. Now before we jump into the combat demonstration, let's take a moment to talk about the drones. Although I have four different drones here in the drone bay, there's really only one that we really care about all that much, with a secondary one that's useful in niche circumstances, and then just two sets of backup drones in case we need them. The one that we're mainly going to be focusing on is the Gecko, and if like me you come from Eve, on, uh, Eve Echoes, you may not know what a Gecko is. Essentially, this is a fairly expensive drone. It has double the bandwidth requirement of a regular heavy drone, but comes with twice the combat capabilities. It's a really powerful little drone, and well worth the investment. On a Rattlesnake, it works really well, because we can only launch two heavy drones anyway, which means we can launch one Gecko, and it's going to be getting the damage bonuses from the Rattlesnake, which makes it really quite scary. This is the drone that we're going to be using for 99% of this combat anomalies. Um, this is the one you're going to be using. Do be aware it's a fairly shiny little thing, and if people see a gecko on D-Scan, they will often come and try and shoot you just to loot your geckos, because they are fairly expensive drones by comparison to the others. And you want to make sure you've got pretty good sort of drone recall ability, you're watching your drones carefully, because you really don't want to lose one of these. If you do happen to lose it though, that is why we have a couple of wasps in here. 
These really should be Kaldari Navy Wasps, but I just had two Wasp ones kicking around from a previous run um, that I just shoved in here. But Kaldari Navy are theoretically your better option. The other damage type here we have are the Curator 2s. Now, if we go to the show info on these, these are Sentry Drones, and not everyone likes Sentry Drones. I'm not a big fan of them, but the fact that they have a 55.4 kilometer optimal range with a 14.4 kilometer accuracy fall off means that sometimes you just want to be shooting at something in the distance. You drop your Curators, you shoot some of those stationary turrets and just go for it that way. Again, I tend to prefer the Gecko for the most part, but it's there as an option if you need it. I don't really use the Curators, but again, I don't want to be carrying too many uh, Geckos in here because that's just going to make for a powerful loss mail. The final one that is a little bit niche, but can be incredibly helpful, are the Hornet EC300s. Now, these are electronic countermeasure drones, ECM. Essentially, what they do is they attack a target, but rather than dealing damage, they jam its lockers, its lock sensors. So essentially, if you are locked down by someone and you're being scrammed in place, you can drop those Hornet EC300s on them. They will then cause that target to unlock you, at which point you can warp off to safety. That is an incredibly powerful ability if you need to make a getaway. And when this rattlesnake's coming in at 1.4 billion isk, we kind of want to have that there as a failsafe just in case things start to go wrong. I've not had to use them yet, otherwise I'd be showcasing it in this video, but they are well worth having. It's that kind of thing that you never need them until you do. And the day that you need them, if you don't have them, well, that's a 1.4 billion isk loss mail. Anyway, with all of that said and done then, let's jump into actually showcasing this in action. Now, I've just finished running a combat site in this Rattlesnake, and I'm warping into the next one. First thing you should really do with your drones is set up groups for them, which is going to allow you to recall them and launch them just that little bit faster. I at least have an active combat and an injured group. The active combat is usually set to favorite. That way, if anything takes damage, I move it to the injured group, recall it, and then just send out more from the active combat. That said, we've only got one gecko that we're really using here, so it's not a huge thing. This is, of course, a Fortification Frontier Stronghold. Yay, everyone's favorite C3 site. But again, the Rattlesnake will comfortably run all four of the different C3 combat anomalies. We arrive on location, we're going to drop the mobile tractor unit, and we're going to bookmark it, but otherwise we're just literally going to park next to it. There is no real point moving this Rattlesnake. You've got range to deal with everything. Now, in the first wave, of course, the Emergent Defenders are frigates. They don't really do much. The, uh, the Awakened Defenders are battle cruisers. They're not battle cruisers. They're just cruisers that do DPS and not much else. Um, and it's the Awakened Defenders that are the trigger, so we're going to work on those secondarily. We're going to kill the frigates first. And you'll see that the Gecko, combined with those Rapid Heavy Missiles, have no difficulty applying damage to the Emergent Defenders. Remember that most of my missile skills right now are essentially, I've got five in most of the missile skills, except for the subsidiaries. Things like Missile Bombardment, Target Navigation Prediction, most of that's still sitting at four. So I'm not perfectly skilled into missiles, but you can see we're doing massive amounts of damage. And obviously you can also see, since the Viridian update, what those Scourge missiles look like. And I love those explosions, I love the new trails, I just adore the new missile graphics. You'll also notice the cool thing about this Rattlesnake is it literally has one button. It's like the healer, it's a passive fit. The only thing we ever have to press is our rapid heavy missile launcher, which is fully stacked, so it's just F1 to shoot at the next target, F to launch the drone, and then we use things like, you know, Control and R to bring the drone back if we need to. Um, otherwise, you've just got plenty of time to hit D-scan. You don't have to worry about activating all these different modules and doing all these different things. And again, just look at those Scourge missiles. They're just such cool explosion graphics now. It's honestly one of my favorite things about the Viridian update, and I will continue to wax lyrical about it because it is just so pretty. Look at them, that sort of swampy green coloration um, as the missiles explode. And you can see the gecko there orbiting and just blapping and doing its thing. And here we have the 35 second reload time for rapid heavy missile launches. Oh, I love Rapid Heavies to pieces. They're great DPS. They apply well to different targets, you know, better than, say, torpedoes or cruise missiles would. But, uh, yeah, that reload time, it's just awful. Like, the, the, the Awakened Defenders died, and I'm still reloading. 
Anyway, wave two. Wave two, we have two awakened up holders. These, these are very soft, squishy cruisers that like to orbit about 30 Ks. They have webs and they have six gigajoules per second of neutralization each. Ultimately, the orbiting at 30 Ks doesn't matter to us because we've got 55 K range, I think, on this. Plus the gecko is nice long range as well. Um, Ultimately, they are the triggers. We can't kill both of them. And remember, with both of these on us, that's 12 gigajoules of neutralization a second. Um, we can only survive, what, seven, I think it was? Um, 7.6 or something like that. So we do kind of want to get rid of one of these just to stop us getting drained. Then we go after the Awakened Defenders as priority because, well, yeah, they do the most DPS to us. Um, again, we can actually out-tank these. There's not all that much damage coming through pretty straightforward. We're just going to sit here and blap these one by one, keeping up that D-scan. You can see the mobile tractor unit there doing its thing, dragging all that loot in. Just enjoy the site, really. Make sure that you have your escape plan ready. Obviously, I've got a safe bookmark already set up. Um, I've got the mobile tractor units set up for different sites as well. I've got those bookmarks still there. So in a worst case scenario, I can always jump back to a different mobile tractor unit. And that actually essentially works like a safe because the site is now clear. The site doesn't appear on the cosmic anomaly list anymore so every time i clear a site as long as i keep the mobile tractor um bookmark there though i will scoop the mobile tractor unit every time because it can be scanned down i can essentially warp out to my safe point and then i can warp to different um of the mobile tractor unit bookmarks as well in order to stay nice and safe whilst friends arrive if someone's trying to combat scan me down i can just keep moving between those different sites so actually the more sites you clear the more safe points you have in space which is pretty sweet because the wrecks and jet cans and things like that can't be scanned down as long as you scoop the mobile tractor unit that cleared cosmic anomaly becomes essentially a safe for you which is really quite cool Anyway, though, you can see here we're chunking through that Awakened Defender at speed. Again, we've got that 35 second reload. Oh, I hate it so much. It just, it sucks to sit there and have to watch that 35 seconds click down with no damage applying. Fortunately, the Gecko is powerful enough that it just, it does the thing. There we are. Final Awakened Up Holder. Reload's about to finish. And we're going to start shooting at that. And then we'll be moving on to wave three. You'll notice I'm not really skipping ahead on this one because it's actually fast enough with the rattlesnake that I don't really need to. I can just find things to blather on about because I'm Captain Benzie and that's what I do. Ranting and rambling is kind of, you know, my pastime. I kissed the Blarney Stone when I was younger. And if you don't know what that means, look it up. It's an Irish thing. Anyway, so final wave, Awakened Upholder, two Awakened Defenders, an Awakened uh, Preserver, and a Sleepless Upholder. Again, I want to take out the Awakened Upholder first because it does have a little bit of neutralization. Um, dropping that Awakened Upholder will take me from 18 gigajoules per second of neutralization down to 12. The Sleepless Upholder, the battleship, does 12 gigajoules of neutralization a second. Um, but the second target is probably going to be the Awakened Preserver just because it has remote reps on it. And those remote reps can be most annoying when you're trying to shoot at things and it's just sitting there doing its thing. I do love as well that the sleepers have the Mjolnir missiles, and you can see that cool effect every time I get hit by one of those as well. Anyway, we are now onto the Sleepless Upholder. We send the Gecko and the missiles on at that. We can watch those Schmexy Nova missile explosions. There's the Mjolnirs on me, and there's the Scourge missile explosions on the Upholder there in the distance. Once again, uh, no, no, it's not a reload. It's just me trying to tap it and double activate it because, yeah, lag. Good old Zimbabwe lag. A lot of people say, you know, oh, how is the lag down there? Watch my, uh, watch my modules when I activate them from time to time. You'll see that I sort of hit the button. It starts to flash, but it doesn't start to activate. And then suddenly you'll see the activation cycle is already two thirds of the way through. It's not fun, but it's kind of how we, you know, have to live with things here. There we are, there's a nice Mjolnir explosion on me, some more Scourge on the uh, Upholder there, and we're back to that reload. Fortunately though, the Gecko should chew through this quite quickly. The Sleepless Upholder doesn't have much in the way of structure, and you can see it goes down quite quickly to that Gecko. And that's pretty much the danger in the site gone. We've got no neutralization left. The damage now is below what our shield recharge rate is. So it's pretty straightforward. We're just now going to shoot these two awakened defenders, which are pretty much the same as they were in wave one and wave two. They're going to go down nice and quickly. Then I'm just going to be sitting here next to the MTU. I can scoop the loot and then scoop the MTU and move on to the next site. It's really that simple. 
You see, I do have a friend on D-Scan as well. There's a guy flying around doing some scanning and mapping and that. Um, he's keeping an eye on D-Scan for me as well in case while I'm filming this, I'm, you know, not D-Scanning properly. It's at this point, if you wonder what I'm doing having a look through my cargo hold here, that I realize I've actually not picked up the loot properly. I think I've looted the previous site's MTU. I've then uh, had a lag spike. I've scooped the MTU and thus I haven't looted it. So there's a cargo, a cargo canister in space back at that site. So I'll have to walk back to that mobile tractor unit bookmark later um, in order to go and collect that. A lot of you ask what the ISK per hour on these sites is. Essentially, depending whether you're doing a fortification frontier stronghold, an outpost frontier stronghold, a solar cell, or the Aruz construct, it's somewhere in the region of 41 million to 45 million ISK of blue loot. That doesn't vary from site to site. It's not like other things where you can get different amounts, really. You're going to get about that every single time you run one of these sites. So you'll see here, I'm going to just check now and that MTU is bringing the last bits of loot in. But essentially that blue loot, what you do is you scoop it, you then fly out into K-Space, right click it, show market info, and look for the one that has the highest sell order. It's an NPC buy order. Kind of like the Abyssal Dead Space red loot, you've just got to find a station that has NPC buy orders for the blue loot, and you sell it at those. And you're guaranteed ISK from it. It's not like trying to sell it to other players where prices fluctuate, it is a set price every single time. So 40 to 45 million, 41 to 45 million per site, and those sites can be run in 10 to 15 minutes, depending on your skills and depending on your knowledge and how you choose to fly them, also depending on the site. Anyway, there we are, grab the loot, scoop the MTU to cargo hold, and it's time to move to the next site, and you can actually see if I uh, there stack all. Total loot here is now 60 million, but that's including what I have in the uh, cargo bay already. It's about 43 million I've just picked up for this site. Anyway, time to move on. When my game stops lagging, you can see my overview there is completely frozen. But off we go back to my save point and then move on to the next combat site. That's it for this video, folks. If you did enjoy this, let me know how you get on with it. If you're flying a rattlesnake in C3 Anomalies or anything else, let me know what your fit is. I'd love to know how other people are flying this absolute monster of a ship in EVE Online. Otherwise, folks, happy sailing and see you in New Eden.